LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and today we'll be talking with Andy Duncan. Andy is an Austrian economist in the tradition of Mises, Rothbard and Hoppe. And he runs the educational website, um, thegodthatfailed.org. And can occasionally be heard running his own podcast called Radio Free Market World Report. And you can find that at radiofreemarket.com. That's all one word, radiofreemarket.com forward slash world dash report. You will, of course, find these links um, at legalizefreedom.com. Uh, and he also works within the global banking industry as a freelance private educator, uh, teaching many varied clients about derivatives, pricing, securities analysis, and finance in general. The subject of today's discussion is a general one uh, revolving around the ideas contained in a book entitled Democracy, The God That Failed, uh, which was published back in 2001 and written by German economist and libertarian anarcho-capitalist philosopher Hans Hermann Hoppe. Uh, Now, to outline the contents of the book, I'm quoting here from Andy Duncan's own review of it. Um, The book uh, is based on the premise that the privately owned governments of the monarchical age, such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, were bad, but far better than the publicly owned governments of the democratic age, uh, such as the USA. Um, Having established this platform in the first third of the book, Hoppe then moves on to describe how government-free countries adopting the spontaneous natural order of liberty would be the best option of all, and how we could achieve this against the odds of worldwide statist malevolence. Given that liberty is clearly the best way of organising society, uh, which will maximise the voluntary desired ends of everyone alive, and given that humans are clearly intelligent beings, most of whom have at least the potential to see this, even if they haven't reached that point yet, Why is the Western world currently drowning in a swamp of welfare dependency, increasing poverty, de-civilization, family breakup, graffiti, random violence, drugs culture, antisocial behavior, fecklessness, and all the other evil stigmata associated with socialism? And furthermore, given that at least the US of A and possibly the UK approached a near golden age of liberty over 200 years ago, which only started collapsing around the time of the First World War, What is it that's driving these virulent forces of socialism and neoconservatism along when all the evidence around us shows clearly that collectivism is the worst thing that humanity has ever had the misfortune to stumble across? That the situation is only going to get worse is also apparent, but still we sleepwalk on into the socialist superstates, such as the EU, and their eventual combined world government, muttering the mantra, more government, more government, more government even given that the natural human condition appears to always be a wish for more freedom. Nothing, however, seems capable of halting this inevitable steamroller. Why? Now, Hoppe thinks he has the answer. Democracy. Its growth in the Western world is linked directly to the growth of socialism and big government. Hoppe wonders whether this is coincidental or not. Now, due to a slight technical hitch at the top of the show, we've had to dispense with the usual hello and welcome pleasantries, so I'll simply drop right in and ask Andy Duncan what it is that makes Hoppe and the ideas contained in his writing so controversial and yet at the same time so exciting uh, for those of us jaded with the current state of democratic government. He is one of the very few men in the world, perhaps the only man in the world, who was sort of brave enough to challenge this kind of idea that democracy is the, what we should impose around the world. So you'll see now with the, the American government and the British government and all the Western European powers believing that we have this right to go around imposing democracy. And it's just implicit that democracy is the finest thing that's ever been created in the history of the universe. So therefore, that gives us the right to 
to kind of give it to everyone else as a gift. Um, perhaps maybe it wasn't. I mean, the ancient Greeks realised it wasn't. I mean, when the Athenians tried it, sort of 5th century BC, uh, it was invented by a guy called Cleisthenes, who was a member of the Alcmenid clan in Athens. And the reason he invented it was because he was being dominated by another family called the Pisistratid family. Uh, and there was a guy called Hippias who was running around the Persian Empire. And he was about to take over Athens with, with the Persians helping him. Uh, Cleisthenes invented democracy essentially to form a dictatorship of the Alcmenid clan. And from this dictatorship of the Alcmenid clan, and successfully they, they beat the Persians at Marathon and um, um, Platai and Salamis and a few other places. Um, immediately, what happens with democracy? The Athenians create a hated empire called the Delian League Empire, following all the same classic traditions that we see with the British Empire, with the American Empire. So the, you have this democratic core in the city of Athens, and then they go around the rest of the Aegean, just imposing this horrible, hated Athenian empire, hated to the point that virtually everyone else in Greece um, rallied around to destroy Athens in order to crush this this monster. And then democracy died for a couple of thousand years and then was sort of reborn in the Middle Ages of Europe. So, Well, it sort of legitimizes a lot of stuff, doesn't it, really, in that sense, um, that if it's been voted for in a democracy, then that, that, that kind of, that's the green light and it's a, it ticks the boxes and it can't be seen, you know, in some people's eyes as dictatorial because, well, it's been voted, isn't it? It was a fair vote. <laughs> well, we, well, we rule ourselves, don't we? Mm. So when I get a chance every five years to vote for a safe Conservative MP in the Henley-on-Thames area, um, that means that whoever gets voted in into the Parliament can do whatever they like to me. Um, they can take all my property, they can they can conscript me into an army, they can conscript my children into an army. And this is all because I get this meaningless uh, vote, which doesn't mean anything at all every five years. Uh, and and even, even if I agreed with that, which, which anyone who votes does, anyone who votes agrees with this, uh, that a government can do what it likes to you, because you're legitimising them by voting. Yes. Um, so if you agree to vote what you're saying is i want my view to predominate and i'll agree that the other guy's view can predominate um because they've beaten me i've only got 49 percent and they've got 51 percent. therefore they can crush me for five years so when you do participate in this you're just you're just basically giving up all of your rights to the to the ruling people uh, and one of the reasons democracy has become so um, popular amongst governments is it's a great way to ensnare people because before, in the sort of medieval times, um, governments were, were, you know, quite rightly hated and despised. Um, but as people saw a chance of themselves getting into power or their friends getting into power via democracy, they gave up their opposition to government. I mean, if you've read the book, you'll know this is the major idea of democracy, the god that failed, is that before uh, democracy, the, the king and the family and the royal family would rule, would be despised by everybody because everyone realised there was absolutely no chance of them ruling. So this very small percentage of the population, the royal family and their, their immediate surrounders, maybe 1% of the population, could you know tax us and they could uh, have silly little wars. Um, but we would generally ignore them, pay as little as tax as possible, and tax rates would never really get above 5%, 6%. And even the, um, the second British Civil War with Oliver Cromwell, uh, the strange thing about that, it was really a tax protest. Uh, King Charles brings in the ship tax uh, into sort of interior counties of the UK. So there's a tax revolt that, that becomes the civil war. And then as soon as the civil war is won, people around the country think, well, I could now become a leader. And because of this, this tendency of people to think, well, once I might become a leader, I can give up my opposition to government. And um, taxes actually higher after the war than they were before the civil war. Well, this is one of the key um, points that I think that one of the first ideas in the book that was a light bulb moment for me. And uh, I'll just quote here from um, a review of the book that you yourself wrote. Uh -huh. And uh, Hopper's essential argument is that when a monarchical king owned a territory over which he possessed a governmental monopoly of tax and judgment, he passed it on to his heirs with some amount of farsightedness. Because the whole idea was to maintain this, uh, you know, this regime, this line that the the, this would be handed down, and if it was plundered and looted and whatever, it would be a no-fit state. There'd be nothing of value there. So it was don't tax the people too much, don't push them too far, 
and just far enough so that they put up with this, they tolerate it, they realize that they can live with it. Yeah. And the key difference, and again, it was like, wow, the guy's right. When you think about the democratic government, the sort of system that we have here in the UK, what's well, typical of democracies around the world, but in our own case, politicians are there for, relatively speaking, very short term. So their policies and their thinking is short term. And we can see this as government advances each term of government and things get worse and worse on a number of fronts because all the party in power has to really do is somehow fudge their way through an election or two and then yeah. it doesn't then they get it gets passed on to someone else in, in whatever state it's in and then the process starts again and so gradually downhill we go well this is uh Hopper's main idea for those who haven't really got into it it's it's the caretaker king idea where a king sort of and it's it's a terrible thing but the king owns the country well he or she you know, if it's a king it's a he if it's a queen the she has ownership rights over the country and they want to be able to pass something on that's worth something so if, if it was a house um, you owned the house and you had some tenants who might come in um, you own the capital value of the property and the income if you were to rent it out so you're very careful about who you rent the house out to Mm. Uh, you rent it out to good people who are, you know, sort of nice, moral. If they break anything in the house, they'll pay to have it repaired out of their own money. Um, they'll look after things for you. So you're thinking of long term income, whereas um, a caretaker king, a caretaker would would own the property as income, but not the capital value. So what they'll do if, if you say go away for five years and just give it to somebody so you can have all the income from the house. What they're going to do is they're just going to get in 150 people to completely trash the house to to maximize the rent over the five years so when you come back in five years time the house is a complete wreck but the caretaker you left it was has maximized their income and this is what politicians do so you get somebody like gordon brown coming in for instance my favorite uh, british politician of recent times and even he says you know power is something that you just have for a temporary time and he knew that it was stupid and then one day so what you do is you just completely trash the place, completely wreck it, and take as much wealth out of it as you possibly can and spend it on your friends and yourself and your, your cherished little goals, knowing that if you leave a big enough mess, when the next people come in, it's going to take them years to recover. And you might even be able to get in again because you'll have left the place in such a state that after five or six years, the, the, the next gang won't quite have got it back, so you, you'll get in again. Um, so the caretaker idea is absolutely key to this, that if there's no ownership, capital long term ownership, if there's only short term income ownership, then government becomes incredibly short sighted and is just constantly just bleeding as much wealth as possible at any moment and, and not thinking at all about the long term. How does the it's just sort of popped into my head, this would be the civil service and that sort of arm of government shouldn't. Ideally, they have some kind of role to, to somewhat counter that tendency and, uh, you know, and keep things more of an even keel with, with a mind to the medium and long term future. Well, that's the sort of idea, isn't it? But most of the civil servants uh, are just looking after themselves personally and that they're going to be in it for 20, 30 years. So, yes, they might have a, they might have a little bit of a longer term view, but they just think, well, as long as I get my pension, um, as long as I get promoted, then I'll be happy. And as long as I can push the blame for all these problems off onto somebody else. So, so the typical trick is, that, well, the, the problem comes in is the politicians come in and say, I want to do this. And the senior uh, civil servant is going to be promoted if and paid more and given a big bonus if they help that politician succeed in their plan. So you saw the group of people who gathered around Tony Blair, for instance, who are all now working for him at Tony Blair Associates. Mm. They've all kind of moved on. So they're thinking, well, if I help Tony Blair do what he wants to do, um, rape the country uh, for 10 years and borrow and borrow and spend and spend and spend and I will personally be promoted and at the end of it I'll get a nice job in industry because I have all these connections that I've made over 10 years um, I've still got my pension to fall back on which will be index linked and will be nice and solid uh, and it will be somebody else's problem because the last thing the government will cut will be civil service pensions I mean what they'll cut before that uh, are all the things that cause pain because that's what bureaucrats do. Whenever there's a chance to cut any money, the first thing they do is they, they don't sack themselves or their friends. They, they start cutting um, things that are painful. I think there was a case in the United States where I think it was the Washington Parks Department uh, were, were asked to make you know a very small cut in their department. What was the first thing they did? They said, we're going to shut down the Washington Monument. So they, they don't try and save money. They just they just they just think what what would cause the most pain, 
and let's cut that. So, so in the UK, what the NHS would do is they they'd shut down, you know, children's. Um, carcinoma wards, or they shut down old people's uh, renal kidney units, or they, you know, they they don't they don't sack their four hundred thousand pound a year consultants in Nothingsville, um, uh, who, who who need to be just completely removed. They 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 figure out what's the most painful thing we could do. Let's cut that. So I think the civil service, the, the idea of the civil service being a counterbalance to this is is is, is stretched a little. I think they're all selfish. They're all thinking of themselves. They're all serving their masters. They, as long as they can get away with the blame and not be blamed for something, they're quite happy to go along with the politicians' um, urge to um, to just trash the place and take as much wealth as possible and spend it as quickly as possible. I think the other point is what both groups of people do, the bureaucrats and the politicians, is they deliberately entangle us in something like the European Union. And then they use that as an excuse to blame. So when everything goes wrong, they blame the European Union for whatever it is. So it's um, it's a lovely mechanism. They, they take all the rewards um, for running the place on our behalf, and then they pass off all the blame to the EU uh, when things go wrong. Well, two points from that, I suppose. One is... Um, just to remind people or to let them know if they don't already know that government produces nothing and fundamentally government has no money. You know what I mean? It's not like government earns money legitimately doing something, you know, like some other job as it were, and then comes out, oh, I can spend this on government. And the other thing is that no matter how vandalized uh, the economy or the, the country gets, it's still, we can look at the cycle of voting you know, even the last 100, 150 years in this country, it's the same, you know, red and blue, red and blue with the yellow thrown yeah. in every now and again. It's almost like people's imagination in this area has been so closed down that we really have a situation now where if somebody can come along with the best sounding remedies possible, actual radical solutions, and people say, well, it's not worth voting for this guy who sounds absolutely brilliant because he yeah. can't get elected. So they just vote in who wait just long enough for their memory of the last government to to sort of fade a little bit and say okay we'll have labor again they they, they were awful but we'll, we'll go give them a go i think people like to be associated with winners don't they i i just remember tony blair in the 97 election he was really banging on about john major's 30 billion pound a year spending deficit and uh, before politicians get into power they always complain about the tax rates and the borrowing rates and everything and as soon as they get in, the floodgates open, the taxes go up, the, the spending goes up and so on. But I think this is why we might, you know, you can step away a bit uh, from democracy, the God that failed, and maybe get into Hopper's, which, which I think is actually a stronger book, mm. not, not not as populist, not as um, well kind of thought of, but the economics and ethics of private property. And this idea that the government has no money isn't really a general idea, is it? Because even on the, well, and it's the BBC, but the BBC News saying things in the last few months along the lines of and British industry today turned to the Bank of England to provide them with more support. Now what you're sort of saying there is that the government have these resources they're keeping in a, in a, in a vault in the ground and then they're gradually releasing these resources from a vault in the ground to help everyone out. So it's like it's like Uncle, you know, it's like, uh, Uncle Joe or uh, Uncle Sam or, or Big Brother. Mm. They're, they're, they're going to help us uh, but of course, the Bank of England aren't supporting British industry. They're just printing more money. Um, so that's not support. That's that's just that's just taking wealth from those at the end of the economic chain and giving it to those in the centre who print the money. And here's the strange thing, which Hopper makes very clear in Democracy: The God That Failed. If someone was to do what the Bank of England does um, in a private capacity, it's completely obvious that it's wrong. So if I was to print up um, a billion pounds, or even just a million pounds, and, you know, so so the money was indistinguishable from you know proper English coinage, and I was to spend that million pounds from my kind of basement print printery. Um, everyone would instantly know that that's wrong. They would instantly know that I was stealing resources from the rest of society. Uh, I would quite rightly be you know arrested by citizens and quite rightly sort of um, put in the stocks and have rotten vegetables thrown at me for being such a cheat and uh, someone who's taking other people's resources. But somehow when you clothe somebody in a government costume, um, it somehow becomes okay to do it. So, you know, when the Bank of England do effectively the same thing, they're there in a basement printing more than a million, they're printing, you know, 200, 300 billion pounds. Uh, and the same kind of mechanism, doing it digitally, just changing a few binary registers on the computer. 
that's okay because somehow the magic of government has has worn off onto them, and that's the that's the beauty to me of democracy. The God that failed. What Hopper does, and one of the very few, even even Mises didn't see this. I mean, to me, Mises is is in a line with Aristotle, um, Sir Thomas Aquinas, Mises. That to me is 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 a, is a straightforward triplet line. Mm. Um, Hopper's coming from that line, and even Mises couldn't see this. Hopper says there's something wrong here. It's it's wrong. This democracy thing, which gives the government this veneer of respectability when they're doing things that would otherwise, in the private world, be seen as criminal. Uh, it, he, he he takes it away. He's able to see through the other to the other side of the green curtain. He's able to go to the Emerald City and pull back the green curtain and say to the wizard, "You're just a man." You're not a god, and you have failed. And and no one else was able to do it. I mean, even, and Murray Rothbard nearly got there. I mean, he was an anarcho-capitalist. He 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 was the big fermenter of the, the you know the what I call the totally voluntary society. Yeah, his, his um, um, for a new liberty is probably the one for people to read. Yeah, and and, and ethics, the ethics of liberty. Uh, but Hopper's able to in democracy that got that failed, and uh, some of his his few earlier books, two early major books is able to just pull that curtain back and just show it's it's a matrix moment he is who's that fellow in matrix is it morpheus yes he offers us the red pill <laughs> and you 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 buy the book for 10 pounds or whatever it costs and you, you 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 take the red pill off the shelves and you read the red pill and after you've read it um nothing will ever be the same again for you so it, it's it's an incredible it's an incredible tour de force and uh, all i can say is thank 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 the deity above us for Hopper. Yeah, quite. Well, I mean, you're talking about in terms of uh, money printing or not even these days, money creation on a screen that takes on this guise of acceptability when it's done by government. I mean, just taking that one or two steps further down the road, I mean, government can kill you and it's Absolutely. okay. They, and they have. the more. Uh, I can't remember how many millions, it's in the hundreds of millions of people killed in non uh, combat situations oh, in the, hundreds, in the, hundreds of millions hundreds. in the 20th century by governments yeah, the government is the, I can't remember who said it or maybe it's just a generic thing but government is the biggest threat you will ever face <laughs> yeah and I, I think they get away with it by saying yes all the other governments are terrible but but yours is or oh, yours is the good one yours is the uh, yours is the okay one and, and to some extent this is true in a certain way for the British over the last 300 years and this is another point Hopper makes if you want to beat another government, what you need is more resources than them. Um, so if you have two governments, let's say the French government and the British government, and, and the French government are completely bleeding their people, you know, completely stripping the food out of their mouths in order to live a, a lovely life at Versailles and with peacocks and, and ice fountains and everything, um, then you don't have enough resources to be able to wage a war. Whereas, say, the British government because it was much freer because of the Germanic history, you know, if you go really, really back, you, you're talking about Beowulf and you're talking about resisting the Roman Empire and Teutoburg Forest and you're talking about a quite warlike, uh, freedom-loving people, the British, and this comes forward maybe a thousand years or so, to, to probably the freest country in Europe. Because we were the freest country in Europe with the best property rights, uh, the best kind of um, freedom, the internal society of the UK was able to produce a lot more resources. So the government of the UK was able to take that bounty of resources and use them to beat all these other governments in these fights around the world, um, you know, with the um, the Royal Navy and so on, and create the empire. And a similar thing has happened in the United States, where they were even freer than us. In fact, they, well, I say us, freer than the British government, mm. because they managed to throw off the yoke of the British empire and they had an almost anarchistic society, you know, uh, for 100, 150 years until maybe up to the uh, the American, what I have to call the War of Northern Aggression. Some people probably know it better as the Civil War. Um, so because of this, because of this almost anarchistic society, they had very, very free, very anti-government uh, because of the British and the American Revolution. They had enormous resources. And then when the British Empire started introducing pensions and so on and just collapsed into this welfare state, the American Empire then then proceeded to take over from the British Empire. So this is another strange thing about Hopper. He, he, he sees through these other bigger points such that the freer society 
because the people there can feel able to generate more resources with more uh, kind of safety, they will generate more resources. And then the government, which is running that country, can then help themselves to those resources to wage bigger and better wars than the ne- neighbouring countries, which are bleeding their people down to kind of the Stone Age. So this, again, there's, there's more to Hopper than just being anti-democracy. Oh, absolutely. Now, he, um, the book, of course, um, helpfully comes on to all sorts of ideas about alternatives, uh, alternative arrangements, ways of uh, living and organising ourselves. Uh, there's a stage, however, which I think we're seeing manifesting very much now, you know, in Europe and the US particularly, that these things tend to go through and that the ransacking that we referred to earlier uh, of the government, the sort of caretaker temporary uh, regime, that then starts to become reflected in society at large yeah. as incentives to um, to do positive things and to create and to <clears throat> to build for the future and what have you. Those gradually get removed and that further manifests itself in actual societal problems. Um, yeah. We know all sorts of you know drug problems, relationship problems, violence, um, and the list is, is, is long and uh, tawdry, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, you could you could read a you could read a newspaper like the Daily Mail, and the Daily Mail will say, "What has gone wrong with British democracy? We've got all these people on drugs, and we've got these welfare problems, and we've got these sink estates, and we've got these sink secondary schools, and so on." Even Alistair Campbell uh, recognised there were sink comprehensive schools the um, a few years ago, um, and the Daily Mail's got it wrong. It's not in spite of democracy that we have these problems. It's because of democracy. That we have all of these problems because what's happened is because everyone thinks everyone else owes them a living through welfare uh, i might think well i'm going to be in the 51 percent so i'm going to vote for the other 49 percent to um, to give me all their stuff now if you're still silly enough to keep working while i'm while i'm a bum on welfare just bleeding you dry you're still probably likely going to produce less and, and hide more from me so you're going to produce less I'm not producing anything because I'm taking from you and I just become degenerate. Um, I, Because I'm just living off someone else, I have higher time preferences, which means I just think about today and uh, rather than the future. Uh, the people who do think about the future leave. So they go to Singapore, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Australia, Canada. They just, they just get out of, say, someone like Britain in the 70s because of the high tax rates and so on. And they go somewhere else where they can prosper, hopefully as low tax a jurisdiction as possible. So so we're left with more and more people here who just think they're owed a living by everyone else. And then we just degenerate into uh, people who think for the short term. Now, if you're thinking short term, then drugs and things could be quite attractive because they, you know, we, we, you sort of know they're going to damage you long. You're taking heroin. Everyone, I think, knows even people who take heroin. That's not really a good thing to do. But, you know, I'll live for the moment and there'll be a dull check in the morning to, to keep uh, to keep me going. So it's because of democracy. It's because of welfare, which is generated by democracy, where 51 percent of people vote for the other 49 percent to the, the haves to give them something that we have mm-hmm. these problems. It's not in spite of democracy. Now, of course, uh, when this, um, it doesn't come up in these exact terms in the mainstream media, but when the welfare state is raised it's very much treated as, as a holy cow that yeah. even though it didn't used to be there, a bit like democracy itself, now that it is here, it has to stay there forever. And the first thing people say is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, what about people who can't provide for themselves? And we can all think of examples of people who are genuinely helpless and who we as human beings would do something to help. So yeah. that instinct, I think, is natural. Um, but that's become that's not reflected honestly and clearly in the welfare state that we have. No, no, it's not because what happens is people think uh, you see you see a man lying in the gutter. You think you don't think oh I can help him because I'm a good Samaritan. You think well the state should be looking after him. I'm going to walk on by. I already pay enough taxes. Why should I have to give him any more? I've had enough. So it actually makes us um, it makes us anti giving. It makes us anti. You know there's still a huge charitable impulse in the British people, but. There is a tendency to think, well, you know, I'm already being hammered for taxes and that person there, all they've got to do is sign on, they'll be fine. Um, so I think it takes away from the, the kind of human spirit. It just makes everything grey and awful. Also, you're having that money extracted you with menaces. I mean, if you don't pay, you're going to jail. I mean, you, you, you know, you're going to be banged up. And if you try to escape the jail, you'll be beaten up. 
And if you keep fighting, eventually you'll be shot. You know, you'll be killed. Mm-hmm. So it, it's it's not it's not a nice impulse that we're doing. I mean, the, the churches and things used to do this. Churches used to you know, people used to give money to churches. But here's here's the thing about private welfare. With public welfare, um, people don't really care that much. But with private welfare, if a man asks me for a hundred pounds um, because he's having a hard time, then I'm going to make sure that if I give him a hundred or a thousand or whatever pounds, he's going to he's going to clean himself up. So if he's drinking, for instance. I'm going to make sure that he hasn't he's not spending any of that money on alcohol. I'm going to make sure that he's not able to get alcohol and if he wants to keep drinking then I'm not going to give him any money. The problem with welfare is it's just it's ripped from me and then it's just handed out to whoever wants it who's in the 51% voting for me to be uh, to be you know kind of have my property taken from me uh, by force. So I think welfare actually it destroys the human spirit. And the other thing is being trapped on welfare is probably the worst thing in the world. I mean, to, to give I think to give people welfare is 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 awful. It, it traps them. You see these welfare and poverty traps all the time. And the socialists and the Keynesians and the conservatives still haven't solved this this trap problem of uh, demotivating people from working. So, I mean, you go to a coffee bar in London. Um, will you hear many British accents? No. Because all the British people in London who are in a certain position who, could, who might get those jobs are all on 30, 35,000 pounds a year equivalent incomes. And, and if they get a job in Starbucks for 25,000 a year, they're going to lose all their benefits. They're going to be worse off. So the people that you see are from Eastern Europe and Portugal and, and other places coming in. Um, welfare is absolutely terrible. And we've got to think about where welfare came from. Welfare came from Bismarck. And was Bismarck a nice person? No, Bismarck was an appalling person. And the reason Bismarck introduced welfare into Prussia was in order to turn the people into slaves. I mean, that's why he did it. He didn't want the uh, he didn't want the Prussian people questioning the authority of the Kaiser in in warfare. Um, so he, he he enslaved them with welfare. And then those same policies were copied by in this country copied by Winston Churchill directly from Bismarck. And the same sort of thing has happened in this country over the last 60, 70 years. It's accelerated under terrible people like Gordon Brown who've, who've put even more millions of people in, into this into this dependency trap and uh, obviously paying for millions of people to hand out the welfare as well so all those people employed by the government to, in this welfare industrial complex they all want the welfare to go yeah. on I mean imagine you're a senior manager in the, in the in the welfare industrial complex in the UK and and you're earning I don't know let's let's just make up a number 90,000 a year plus an index link pension and that somebody comes along to you, a fairy, and says, uh, if we wave a magic wand, there'll be no more welfare and we won't need you anymore. You know, th- what's the response going to be? The human response to that is, no, no, let's just let's keep it going because I've got this lovely salary and I've got this big department and I'm really important. And um, well, so if, that, if you're working, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're working for the, the system in one of those jobs, then you're as, yeah. mu- as much on welfare as anybody sitting on the other side of the desk looking for a handout. Yeah, and you're trapped as well. I mean, because you you're trapped in this uh, this lifestyle, or as you could be doing something, you know, that people would voluntarily want to uh, to uh, for you to do, rather than um, going around with guns to people's heads, saying pay tax to pay my salary, so I can take a little bit of what's left, and then trap these people in a lifetime of welfare. Well, one of the economic ideas, kind of underlying this, is if in a say a business context. Um, we were having a conversation and saying, oh, uh, I've got some money to invest and I'm going to put it into this area or this product or this service. We would reasonably expect the outcome, you know, if we're doing things correctly, for that to grow, that to increase. Yeah. And uh, Hopper has this idea that was kind of, it's not new to anybody who's thought it through, but it was presented to me in a, a unique way at the time that if you subsidize things by putting money into them, you get more of it. You always and, get more of it. Yeah. yeah, and this is where the, the welfare thing comes in. Equally for any other negative thing in society that money tends to be thrown at in an attempt to make it go away. Yeah. Well, this is the tax idea, isn't it? Because if you tax something, you get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you get more of it. So if you tax people, they tend to earn less. Um, and if you subsidize people on welfare, you know, pay them more, they'll tend to work less. Because what's the point? They get stuck in these welfare traps and then they just become totally dependent, uh, and then you and then you see the decivilization of society. You see the increased drug taking to try to escape from the the horrors of being trapped in welfare. You see the increased alcoholism again to to escape uh, 
I mean, I, I, I've lived in welfare. I, you know, I, I used to collect um, tokens. This is what I used to do. I used to collect tokens in front of everybody at school to then hand over and get a free school meal. And, and the, 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 the shame and the horror, I, I, I'm not sure whether people feel the same shame now, but it's absolutely horrible to have to collect this token in front of 200 people who have all had to pay for their meal. And then you just rock up uh, to, the, to, the, to the desk and you pick up your meal for free. It's a horrible thing to do to children. It makes uh, you know it makes people feel very bad about themselves. Well, I had it, to do the same thing, incidentally, uh, when I was a child. And at one point, it was quite it was an early revelation for me. It was when I was in my early teens. At one point, I said, you know, I was working out what the dinner cost, and it wasn't very much. Yeah. And I thought, do you know what we, uh, even, even as a single parent family, we can afford this. And what's more, I can afford this out of my limited pocket money so thereafter I, yeah. deci I decided to buy that and it was really quite liberating because I didn't go broke we as a yeah. family didn't go broke and yeah. we, we always found the money from somewhere and you know if you needed that money to eat well let me tell you that really focused you on ways that you could legitimately get the money well good for you it's all I can say I I, I was I was a bit less um uh... Because I was a, I was a mad communist then, so I didn't feel. Uh, <laughs> Are there I any other quite, type? <laughs> I didn't feel quite the same need to uh, to repay. I just thought society owed me that meal because obviously they'd starved me because um, because they they were evil and they were all Nazis or whatever. Yes. I don't know, but it, I think it skews people's thinking as well. I mean, it skewed my thinking for you know thirty years. I mean, I was a kind of hardcore socialist for a for a very long time. Um, I think Hopper was as well actually in his early days. That's was Hayek, of course, uh, mm -hmm. not such a hardcore person, but. Uh, very much a socialist in the 1920s and Mises rescued him so I, I think the welfare thing isn't just bad because it, it enslaves you and because it, it makes you feel terrible I, and traps you in this kind of slum of dependency I think also it skews your thinking again that's another reason why they do it they do it because uh, they want people to believe in government they want people to believe that you know big uncle Sam or uncle Joe or big brother is, is, is a caring sharing friend and is your only uh, is your only hope so you must help the government um, tackle all these naughty people who say we should pay less taxes and shouldn't be uh, quite as robbed as they as they currently are and that's the other thing that becomes very very skewed in all of this um, as presented to us these days is the idea of someone you know getting ahead making money business and there's so much that that is corrupt and that is evil that happens in that sphere you know in the, the money-making sphere the capitalist sphere if you will uh, but there also is in the socialist sphere in the big government sphere in the welfare sphere but it's it's almost like each new situation brings a different quite often contradictory argument uh, counter argument from the government so uh, you you mark out some of the evils of a, a welfare system or how it's producing uh, outcomes that were not intended and they then have a critique for that and equally, it seems that they're after everyone, chasing everyone, but they're for everyone at the same time. And I suppose that's one of the other conundrums of democracy is that the government ostensibly has to try and be everything to everyone. And uh, well, I started that talking about the money making idea, because if you then look back, stand back and look at the system in horror and go, OK, I've got to just try best I can to provide for myself and just secede from this system, the yeah. government will be after you <laughs> like a flash Try yeah. to see what you've got, where it's coming from, and get as much as possible from you. Yeah, it's it, it is it is quite strange. And of course, what they do is they just drive people away. So they drive, you know, if if uh, if you haven't got any ties, and uh, if you haven't got any family that's kind of keeping you somewhere, which is um, or a house. Of course, one of the reasons their governments promote house ownership is because they want to lock you down into a certain country. Uh, if you're just renting, it's it's much easier to leave. So they, 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 the house ownership thing isn't entirely benign as well. I mean, nothing the government does is benign. Well, it's one of the reasons is to lock you into a, into a particular location. But if someone does go to S S Singapore or Liechtenstein or Dubai or all these other places, um, then the government have lost all of that income. So they're getting 45% plus national insurance of nothing rather than, say, the Hong Kong tax rate of 10 or 20% of something. Uh, with no VAT in that particular place. And it's the strange thing about Hong Kong, of course, is that um, the guy who, I've forgotten the guy's name, who created the modern Hong Kong, a British civil servant, mm -hmm. it was just following old British classical liberal policies. And now the, now the Chinese revere this man and worship him. Um, if only we could have the same policies that we have in Hong Kong, 
uh, which we sort of, as British people, invented. It was um, quite interesting. There's another thing about Hopper, of course, is that people think he's um, a monarchist, or is he isn't. If, if you read Democracy, the God of Failed, he, he does spend a lot of time saying why a uh, monarchical system is better. But what he's saying is it's, it, it's better than democracy. He's not saying he's a supporter of it. He's, you know, he thinks there's a better system beneath that, and that's a, a totally voluntary society. And maybe we might be able to work backwards through. I mean, we won't maybe be able to go straight to a totally voluntary society. It'll be a very small steps. So it'll be either very, very small territories which secede like you want to do, mm-hmm. which is why I want uh, Scotland to secede. And then um, I want the Cornwall to secede and Wales to secede and Northern Ireland to secede. Yay. <laughs> and then uh, and then all these other, you know, Truro in Cornwall to secede. Because the smaller government is, the better it is. Because if you can walk down the street and talk directly to the prime minister, like people can do in Monaco and they can do in Singapore and places, they're much less likely to, to rob you. Uh, if you're in a big, big place like the EU or the United States, somewhere massive, it's much easier for a politician to, to rob you because they're so much more remote from you. And then gradually we step away and we all start seceding down to the tiniest, tiniest territories. And then once you're down to the really tiny places, you then start getting a, a totally voluntary society. To me, this is the great shame of the United States that the colonies didn't stay as separate separate countries and well quite i mean we're, we're coming uh just in a moment or two to um to get really get into the area that you've opened up of secession and uh smaller governed areas and self-government and uh, you've mentioned the states so perhaps just at this point again another interim stage is democracy quote unquote uh-huh. ra- rapidly just taking us all into uh socialist super states of various types and we use the word socialism for a lot of people, it it doesn't have they, they forget about sort of the horrors of communist Russia and they think it's sort of vaguely warm and fuzzy term that basically means everyone looking out for everyone else and everyone's treated fairly. Everyone, yeah. no one goes without that sort of thing. So perhaps it might be worth before we talk about you know America descending into a, a socialist nightmare. People were saying, "What are you talking about? That sounds fantastic." What the sort of what the crux of the problem with social a socialist ideals are because basically socialism. Socialism does not work. It has been tried. But just how would you put across in sort of simple layman's terms what, what we're dealing with? The problem with socialism. The yes. problem with socialism is one of ownership. Um, if you live in Hopper world in the future, as we I think we will eventually one day, I'd, uh, I hope anyway, uh, you own yourself. And because you own yourself, you can make decisions. I can decide to do something because I own myself. With a totally socialist society, other people own you. The problem with that is that you own other people. So so no decisions can be made because um, you're all sitting around in committees deciding what to do with other people, with with the ownership of other people's bodies and their lives and their property. So that's one major problem. Uh, Or you can have slavery, of course, where uh, someone else owns you and can decide what to do with you. But... The thing with slavery is we always do the absolute least amount we can possibly get away with and still not get whipped or beaten. So you end up with very, very low economic output. Mm. Um, when, when everybody owns everybody else, you, it's chaos because <coughs> no one knows what to do. No one can decide anything. So you get low economic output. And when you all own yourself, it's, which is what we naturally think we do. I, th- I, th- I think all people are naturally libertarian to be honest. I think we're innately freedom loving. And the left are often half right. Uh, in a lot of things, such as the ability to, you know, um, imbibe plant, dried plant material and so on. Yes. Uh, and to not have nuclear war and all these things. So they're half right, which which is good. Uh, once you once you once you own yourself, then you have much, much uh, greater economic production. You have much greater wealth, much less suffering and so on. But the real heart of the problem with socialism is very subtle. And von Mises uh, discovered, well, he, he kind of worked it out what the problem was now he said there were two two major problems in socialism the first major problem is that people who's going to take out the garbage so in a perfect socialist world we all want to be david beckham we all want to be robbie williams we all want the nice jobs we all want to be um film stars don't we we all want to be justin timberlake uh, which oh by the way is a great film in time which i recommend to every single libertarian out there just watched it last night i, I thought justin timberlake was a kind of shoe 
but he's actually quite a reasonable actor and the film he's in in time is just wonderful for all sorts of libertarian ideas. Anyway, I'm going off the point. The point here is, um, the, the, who's going to take out the garbage? I, I want to be just in Timberlake. I don't want to be the man who takes out his garbage. So I need incentives. So the socialism strips away incentives. It just says we're going to, we're a committee or someone, usually it's going to be a bureaucrat um, in charge of a committee, is going to decide no matter what I do, I, they're going to give me uh, £100 a week because that's all I need in their opinion. So I can be just in Timberlake and all I get is £100 a week. Or I can take his garbage out and I get £100 a week because that's what we both need to live. And that's just not going to work because Justin Timberlake will be happy because at least he's, you know, being in movies and things and kissing pretty girls, um, driving around in fast cars as, as an actor. But, you know, the guy taking out the garbage is just going to stay in bed and say to heck with this. Hmm. Now, Mises said, OK, I'll give you that. I'll, we'll assume that we've bred or we've somehow created ants, human ants, worker ants who are perfectly happy to do whatever the, the work direction committee tells them to do so there's no problem with incentives that the soviet union crumbled under um we, we're all absolutely you know we, we get up in the morning with our red red berets on and we sing the internationale and we all we all run off to go and collect the garbage of justin timberlake while he goes and uh, kisses girls in films so he said the second problem was actually the calculation problem and the calculation problem works like this if you have a private market, let's, let's just imagine 100 people doing 100 different things on a little island somewhere. Um, you know what the prices of things are because you can take your goods and you can take them to somebody and say, well, I've got uh, I've got three chickens and you've got 50 pickles. I, I want some pickles. I've got some chickens I don't need. Um, you've got some pickles you don't need. Let's swap. And then eventually you figure out that the, the going rate, which is constantly fluctuating depending on the, uh, the amount of chickens and the amount of pickles and the desire for chickens and the desire for pickles, is about one chicken for 25 pickles. So that's a market price. And that's arrived at by 100 individuals sort of in this balancing nexus of prices. And eventually we end up with, uh, with one particular commodity, which is usually, it doesn't have to be, it could be cockle shells, but it usually ends up as either silver or gold for lots of reasons that are too boring to go into right now. But we end up with one commodity, which ends up as the uh, intermediate uh, medium of exchange or the money. So that now we can value chickens and pickles in terms of, of cash, in terms of money. So we know where we are. Now, where does the price of chickens come from? Uh, say one gold coin per chicken. Or one, that's probably more realistic, one silver coin per chicken. It comes from everyone's in society's demand uh, and supply of chickens. And it's constantly fluctuating. And all these prices fluctuate around society, telling us what to do. So if the price of chickens starts climbing for some reason, people just decide they like chickens, then I start growing chickens as well because I think, oh, I'm going to cash in on this, this growing trend in chickens. And so the supply of chickens increases. And so because there's a great supply, because I'm trying to cash in, the price goes down until we get this, these balances, these evolving. I mean, straight from Darwinism, we get these we get these evolving prices constantly moving around society, which tell us exactly what to do. If a price of something goes up, some of us decide to start doing it. If a price of something goes down, um, let's say suits, the price of suits goes down and I make suits, then I stop making suits and I go and do something where I'll make more money with my time. So we, the price system is driven by all the individuals, all putting into the nexus, this price nexus, what it is they want, what it is they can do. And we get this evolving, perfectly balanced, self-balancing system. Now, socialism. When socialism arrives, we don't, uh, we don't use the market anymore. We, we abolish the market. We hate the market. We hate the market deciding what to do. And we have a central bureaucrat or a committee or even all of us voting once a week to decide what uh, what we should do and what we end up with is people deciding to do things on whims there are no more prices because the everything is decided by the central committee what to do so they decide to say oh we haven't got enough chickens let's put all production into chickens well in russia they they did it in with kalashnikovs and they did it with tanks and so on uh, and the whole thing just falls apart and now you get bureaucratic controls saying oh, we need a thousand tons of nails and so the easiest way to make a thousand tons of nails is to make one nail that weighs a thousand tons. And so the, the manager of the factory that makes nails, it makes one nail for a thousand tons and, and hits his quota because he doesn't have a market. He doesn't have to sell this silly thing. Uh, he hits his quota. Um, he gets paid and he can 
he can uh, he can survive. So you end up with these economic dislocations. There's no price system. No one knows what to do. And the more removed from the price system uh, that socialism gets, the worse it gets. Now, the Soviet Union actually, aside from being subsidized by the West quite often, um, it survived for so long because it could see prices in the West. It could see what was valuable. It could see what was not valuable. And it could make vaguely, the Central Planning Committee could make vaguely rational decisions uh, based on Western prices. Now, if you'd remove them completely from Western prices, it would have collapsed much, much, much quicker. Mm. And as we as we had as we get more and more islands of socialism in a society, <clears> say in the UK, a bigger NHS, a uh, bigger franchise rail network, a, a bigger school control system, you get more and more economic chaos in the country. Because if you're a teacher and you don't have to worry about pleasing parents because you're working in the state system and you just get paid anyway, as long as you meet the needs of the local bureaucrat, then you get these economic dislocations, uh, things just start going horribly, horribly wrong. And that's the problem with socialism. I do recommend your uh, your listeners should pick up a book. Uh, you can get a short version of this from von Mises. I mean, I haven't explained it very well, but if you get, I think it's Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth by von Mises, where, where it's just a straight book that talks about this point, or it's uh, it's embedded within a bigger, much better, much bigger book called Socialism, which is a treatise covering the whole of mm. all forms of socialism. So that's the real problem with socialism. There's no way to calculate what to do. And what you end up with is a planning committee of, it doesn't matter, 5,000 people. It doesn't matter because society itself in the UK, say, is 60 million people. If you let the free market work, you've got 60 million brains working on the problem of economic calculation on a minute by minute basis. If you let the central planners control it, you've got, I'll, I'll be generous, I'll say 5,000 planners in Whitehall on a day by day basis deciding what to do or a month by month basis. And usually with political whims dominating rather than economic sense. So you see things like they're building the Olympic parks. I mean, everyone's going on about the Olympics at the moment, but that's just going to be a gigantic waste of money. They're building these links to Birmingham, uh, these high speed rail links, not because they're needed or because people want them, but because it's a political decision to uh, build the infrastructure of the EU. Uh, you see all sorts of cross, I mean, cross rail is going to be fantastic for me because I actually live at one terminus of cross rail and I work at the, at the other terminus of cross rail on the other side of London. So for me, that project is going to be absolutely brilliant. The thing for the people of uh, Middlesbrough and Newcastle and Edinburgh and uh, Belfast and everywhere else in the UK is they're not going to see any benefit from this at all. I'm going to see a fantastic benefit. And these are the kinds of things which uh, which politicians do. They, they take tens of billions of pounds from everybody and then they just throw it at whatever political whim comes along. And one political whim is Crossrail. And we could, we could go into the, the silliness of Keynesianism about where, where the decision for that came from. Well, then I mean, I think the, <clears throat> what they're doing with the railways for me is very much, I think, just a side point, I suppose. But it's just contrary to, to trends of, uh, yeah. you know, Internet and working at home and what have you. I just think a yeah. massive expenditure on that sort of infrastructure is, is not worth it. Yeah, it seems a bit odd. I mean, just as the banking industry is struggling, um, you build a fantastic infrastructure to help people like me who work in the banking industry to to go to work in the bank in this industry mm. um which is great for us in the banking industry but you know not so good for everybody else well i can get to london from where i am now in two hours yeah uh, or, le or less sometimes and it's like it's hundreds of miles and do you know what i'm okay with that i, I don't yeah. need to have half an hour shaved off that at the cost of 50 bazillion pounds i really don't yeah, and uh, various areas, private property being compulsorily purchased mm. and ruined. Uh, these people who live in those nice villages, having their lives ruined as, as the land around them is compulsorily bought up and turned into a uh, um, fast ice track line. Now, I mean, I don't want to be against progress or anything, but, you know, the, the, the politicians just keep doing this. They don't let the money stay in the pockets of the people. I mean, Gladstone recognised this. Let the money stay in the pockets of the people and let it, let it. I think the word he used was fructify or something. Mm. Let, 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 it, let it be fruitful in the pockets of the people. Stop taking it out of their pockets and then just wasting it on these whimsies that politicians have. Oh, incidentally, um, I think I know where that thousand ton nail is. Well, <laughs> <laughs> letting grab museum. <laughs> I think it's just off the A1 if you're heading to Newcastle. They've oh, the thing they, with the wings. They've yeah. called it art. <laughs> but I'm glad they found a use for it. 
Well, I'm going to see that. I'm going, I'm going to Gateshead in a couple of days. So I'll, I'll drive past that and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be thinking of your thousand ton nail. Yeah, just imagine a 10,000 ton hammer coming down on it. <laughs> yeah. well, Uncle Joe Stalin. Yes. <laughs> uh, where all this is going, generally, our, the discussion is towards uh, the concept um, which, you know, democracy, the God that failed, presents, which is the idea of um, no government, essentially. Uh-huh. Um a system of organizing ourselves that is so different that by today's standards, it looks like no state, no government. And for a lot of people, that is just a a mental leap too far. They can't conceive of it. And like I said earlier, with democracy itself, even though we haven't always had states, governments as we know them now, we've had them yeah. for sufficiently long that we can't imagine ever being undone and ever living differently. Well, this is why governments control schools, of course. I mean, uh, again, going back to the Prussian model, the Prussians wanted compliant soldiers and compliant populations. So they introduced state education um, into Prussia, took these uh, people from the Prussian area and indoctrinated them into the Prussian way. The idea was so powerful and had such a great effect for making the Hohenzollerns and the Prussian kings so powerful that the idea was directly, I mean, directly copied by the people in Massachusetts uh, who wanted to control the, uh, the, the freedom loving people in Massachusetts and, and make them subservient to the to the government of Massachusetts and all the other state governments in the United States thought oh this this looks good uh, even though America at the time had a 99.9 percent read breeding rate lit- literacy rate uh, all the other governments state governments in the United States copied the Massachusetts idea and then Britain copied the Massachusetts idea. So the state education system in this country comes directly via Massachusetts from Prussia. Uh, and the whole point of it, and explicitly stated in Prussia, and explicitly stated in Massachusetts, but not explicitly stated here, is so that the state produces people who are incapable of thinking outside the state. So we're in a goldfish, most of us in a goldfish bowl, and we're just incapable of, of, of getting outside of the state. I think this brings us to another one of uh, Hopper's books. This is the myth of national defence, because... Yes. The, you end up uh, uh, for roads. You need to read a book by Professor Walter Block uh, on the privatisation of roads, because that's the first thing that statists say. Oh, you couldn't have a society without without government roads. But I think a bigger point is the myth of national defence, which uh, Hopper edited. He didn't he didn't write completely, which really gets into uh, the ideas uh, that we really don't need, even for defence, which you'd think if you're inside the goldfish bowl, absolutely must be a state thing. But which uh, which doesn't need to be at all. And that book comes from, I mean, it comes from the Middle Ages. I mean, it comes from Metian de la Boete, who was a, a first anarchist, proper anarchist, not, not a leftist anarchist in the Middle Ages. I wrote a wonderful book that people can find on the Internet. And then that goes through uh, someone called Gustave de Molinari. And uh, the idea there that if 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 a competition is a great thing for, for services and products, then why does it stop being a great thing for public goods? Why does it stop being a good thing for roads? Why does it stop being a good thing for defence services, courts, etc.? So taking those ideas of Gustave de Molinari, um, Hopper ex- expands those um, ideas in the myth of national defence to explore um, why private defence is good. I mean, even the Elizabethans, I mean, that was a pr- the people who fought off the Armada. The reason they beat them is because the Armada was a statist navy, you know, by the King of Spain, pure state navy, and the British navy was privateers. It was total mm-hmm. privateers with letters of mark, who are just sort of the Queen said, "Oh, can you help me out, um, you know, Sir Walter, with your private ship?" And Mr. Hawkins, can you uh, can you help me out with your private ship? And they completely trounced the the Armada, and this is the way things keep going. So that so again, the Napoleonic troops in France, that was a big, massive hundred thousand man statist army in Spain from France uh, with Napoleon sending down various marshals. Who were they defeated by? Well, a little bit by Wellington and the Peninsula War people, but quite a lot by the guerrillas, the private the private warfare people who are fighting the little war, the guerrilla war. Um, again and again, you see the, you know, you see the huge American armies in Afghanistan. Who are they being beaten by? They're being beaten by basically a private army of the of guerrillas. And you see the same thing happening all around the world. If you if a statist army lands and invades, the worst thing you can do is march out a statist army to fight it, mm-hmm. because if they've got more tanks than you, they will win. The best way to defeat them is to fight a guerrilla war, uh, uh, and, and then you will defeat a private war. 
uh, because you'll be much, much more powerful. Anyway, if anyone's interested in those ideas, you re- need to read the uh, the myth of national defence uh, by Hopper. Uh, one great, there's a really great essay in that book. I've forgotten the name. It's uh, Kunelt oh, uh, Ledin, um, who's a brilliant writer. He wrote another fantastic, he wrote a chapter in Menace, uh, the myth of national defence. He wrote another brilliant book called The Menace of the Herd. And this is uh, about the ideas of the death of Socrates caused by democracy and how democracy always goes wrong. And we always end up with these decivilizing, uh, degenerate societies, um, such as the Roman Empire degenerates with democracy. You know, we, we're seeing de- degeneracy uh, in the kind of Western European democracies as well as we as the welfare states of Europe end, as the euro collapses, uh, as hopefully it will collapse. So we're seeing we're seeing all these same ideas playing out again. Um, anyway, must read the myth of national defence. Well, I mean, the idea there, <clears throat> I suppose you also saw in action with the the British in America, where they were trying to keep control of their colony, and you had the small volunteer American force who ultimately managed to beat them. Yeah, and um, that was I mean the analogy there. You know, you can make one with economics in the sense that the, if you looked at the incentives and the motivations of the two different parties and how they differed, uh, yeah. you could make a parallel with, uh, you know, um, a socialist one size fits all versus a free yeah. market. I mean, the Americans really wanted to win. They had staked yeah. everything on it, and they were using all their ingenuity and all their, all their brain power to do whatever they could to get the outcome they wanted. The British were sent over there. They yeah. didn't didn't want to be there for the most part. They had no ideology driving them. They yeah. just wanted to get out of life. They do. I said the British soldiers just had whips driving them. You know, if you disobey, you got fifty lashes or whatever. So so they were going to. It's a bit like a social. Yeah, it was a socialist army. So the people on the ground didn't care really, except they wanted to avoid pain and being being whipped by the uh, sergeants and the, and the officers. Uh, it was centrally planned. So you had one or two generals making decisions that rippled out via corrupt officers who are helping themselves to munitions and selling them onto the guerrillas and things. Um, but the American army, with people by obviously Mel Gibson and 100,000 other Mel Gibsons, yes. were independently thinking. Um, and the problems the Americans had, again, another great book by uh, Murray Rothbard, The Four Volume Conceived in Liberty, which is a fantastic book, absolutely wonderful. Uh, he was saying the main the main problems with the Americans had were when they tried to match the state army with the state army. So when they tried to raise the, you know, the American state army uh, led by Washington, that's when they had the problems. Where they had the great successes were with the guerrillas on the ground fighting a little war, uh, you know, one or two soldiers at a time being shot um, from behind trees, and then the, the Americans would run away and fight another day, and eventually the attrition just wore the British out. And obviously there's a lot of sympathy on the the uh, the British Army's side as well because I mean they, they, they were fighting basically British people and um, you know, it, it, it'd be a bit like the troops from Yorkshire invading Lancashire it was uh, they were fighting their brothers almost so there was a lot you know there's lots of motivational problems again you've got the going back to Mises you've sort of got the incentive problem then you've got the calculation problem of course I mean how many troops to send across the sea how to tax the population that, that are loyal loyalists to pay for all of this so again, the Americans themselves, they've just got to look at their own history to see how effective private warfare can be uh, as a defense mechanism. It threw out the greatest, most powerful army in the world with the most powerful navy backing it up, and they defeated them. And the only real problems they had were when they tried to go army against army. Well, I mean, you could just boil it down to a personal level. Uh, if, if you're anything like me, you don't want to... Uh, I'm too old now anyway. <laughs> but uh, if you're anything like me, you don't want to sign up uh, to join the army to go and fight in Afghanistan, you don't want to get conscripted. But if anybody's going to come into the house in the middle of the night and uh, you know do me harm or rob me, then prepare to die because I've got an incentive. I care. I'm yeah. motivated. You know. Yeah. So uh, the incentive thing again is is, uh, is is a is a is a big problem. I mean, it's just now in Afghanistan. I mean, how many hundreds of thousands of troops do we? Have? How much money have we spent? How many years have we been there? Uh, and we know we're going to lose. We know the Taliban are going to win. It's only a question of time. In five or ten years' time, I don't know which, uh, the Taliban will be in control of Afghanistan again. So why are we still there? Well, we the know Ru- we're going to lose. The Russians spent... I mean, all right, we've been there over a decade now, I suppose, or coming up on. 
Uh, well, no, it was 2001, wasn't it, in Afghanistan, and 2003 was Iraq. So yeah. over it, longer than the Russians were, but the Russians committed far more weaponry and manpower to that situation, and they still left with a tail between their legs. Yeah. And uh, But w when I was growing up, just to zoom back out big picture again, and I was being forced to do all sorts of things, not so much by my parents, but by them saying, well, you've got to, you know, to go to school and to do this and do that. And when I saw that we're education was pointing me and, and the life that was ahead of jobs and cutting the grass on a Sunday afternoon and two and a half kids in a semi-detached house and washing the car. And I thought, where did I sign up for this? At what point did I say, I'm, I'll give myself over to this? I always thought, isn't there some alternative? Isn't there anywhere in the world mm -hmm. I can go where I can just choose what I want to do, when I want to do, as long as I'm not harming anyone else or t asking anything of anyone else? And it wasn't really until I started to read the ideas um, of people like um, Hoppe and others that it became clear to me that there was an entire philosophy, a whole school of people out there with lots of the same ideas yeah. that, that are not these ideas not being exposed to the general population. And I just thought, well, it might still only be an ideal right now, but there is a strong, very powerful human desire to just be free of yeah, this it, uh, this cage that we built around ourselves it, it, it's innate in everybody um i think and all, all we're doing is uh, we're just we're just going with natural law natural feelings natural natural liberty but that's what we're going with we're just going with what is innate to us and the thing is you do sign up to it when you vote that's the problem that, that's mm. one of the reasons they let us vote and that's one of the reasons why people like saddam hussein and the soviet union uh, would make you vote because even though there's only one candidate standing you get 100%, 99.9% turnouts because people would be made to vote because they knew that in going to the voting station and voting for the one candidate, even though that choice is ridiculous, people sort of agree with it and they go along with it. So the same thing happens here. that The politicians get frantic when the voting rates go down and they try to engineer increased voting rates. Because, I mean, if nobody voted in this, I mean, imagine the next election. Imagine, I mean, because you get the government payroll vote all going, you get a lot of people who work for the government going. Um, imagine that no one else voted. Imagine that no one who <clears throat> didn't work for the government voted. Total apathy. I mean, who cares anyway? What difference has it made that George Osborne and David Cameron are running the country rather than Nick Clegg and, and, and uh, David Miliband and Ed Miliband and... Gordon Brown's uh, honchos and all the other people. What difference has it made? I mean, there's been a little bit of tinkering with tax rates, a little bit of tinkering with tax bans, and that's it. I think before we leave tonight, I think we need to talk about the last book uh, I wanted to mention tonight, and a Hopper's, I think, seminal work, actually, which leads on to everything else, and that's a theory of capitalism and socialism. And in that book, he really, really exposes the fact that conservative politics is socialist politics. The only real difference is that the conservative socialists um, are protecting different um, interest groups as opposed to the kind of red socialists. Well, as a pointer, as we're moving into our closing segment anyway, and as a pointer for people who are perhaps still mulling the, the, the beautiful, fantastic freedom idea of just, you know, limited government or no government and no state, uh, why don't we just discuss those very points of that very key point of uh, red and blue, just, you know, ex extremes at either side coming around full circle to meet each other and one becoming indistinguish indistinguishable from the other, ultimately. I think the trick to this is you've got to lose, use the language. I mean, there's um, a socialist I used to follow when I was a socialist called, uh, I've forgotten how to pronounce this exactly, I thought Gramsci. Uh, he said that language was the key thing. The, that's why politicians love to mess around with words. And actually, to, to be fair to them, even though I despise and detest both of them, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair were fantastic with language. I mean, even Gordon Brown did something, you might remember something called the public sector borrowing requirement. Mm. He changed that to the public sector net cash requirement. And doesn't that sound better? It's a requirement that you need. Oh, I better have it then. It's the same thing. It's borrowing. So yeah. they're very, very clever with uh, with words. But the, 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 the word you've got to replace is the word party. And you've got to replace it with faction. So it's not the Conservative Party and the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. It's the Liberal faction, the Conservative faction and the Labour faction. They are all factions of the same Hydra. The Hydra is British government. They're not separate. They're not independent of British government. And then they take it over on our behalf. They are part of the beast. 
And, and if you just put the word faction in there, you, you might just be able to see that they are just part of the same the same awful, terrible beast. And all they do is they log roll. They just take it in turns. So they, they I mean, the, let's just look at the Labour Party, Conservative Party. They both believe in the NHS, which is essentially a communist health system. I mean, dress it up any way you like. It was a an, an attempt in 1948 by the Labour Party to basically create a Soviet Union of Britain. And part of that was to create the NHS. So the NHS is a communist health system and the Conservative Party believe in it. The Conservative Party believe in uh, subsidies for their friends, farmers, uh, people in the city. Uh, they believe in they just believe in different interest groups. The Labour Party will believe in other interest groups. So they both believe in uh, controlling schools. So even if they don't actually own them, the government want to control them. And they, even the Conservative government, even under Margaret Thatcher, for however long she was in power, still ran a massive state school system. So they both believe in state schools, which control your mind. They both, both believe in state health system, which controls your body. Um, there's very, very little to choose between these two heads of the Hydra. There's a few little wrinkles. I mean, the Tory party, Conservative party, pretty much wants to keep the ruling, current ruling class embedded in power at the expense of the rest of us. And the Labour Party wants to replace that embedded power with another group of people who want to be in power, uh, usually themselves and their friends. But it's still... It's still the same, the same beast, just different heads, just different coloured heads. Um, this is the beauty of the book, uh, Hopper book, Theory of um, Capitalism and Socialism, is it exposes why, say, Nazism and, and, and Soviet Union communism, they both end up with massive prison camps. They both end up with massive armies. They both end up with uh, living, horrible situations and statism and state control. Now, they're coming at it from different angles. So the the Nazis are, we always call them. I should I broke a mile rule there. Always call them national socialists because it makes socialists go mad. Um, <laughs> they are trying to preserve the ruling class in, say, Prussia and Bavaria, uh, at, at the expense of the German people or the folk. Whereas the communists are trying to replace the, the bureaucrats. Uh, sorry, replace the aristocrats of Prussia and Bavaria with a new ruling aristocracy, i.e., themselves. So. That's why communism, uh, hard communism, Stalin communism and, and sort of Nazism, national socialism, they do start from different positions because they're coming from different ends of the spectrum of, of power. But they both end up looking the same because they both have the same kind of ideas that the state is the thing to be worshipped. The state is the God. The state is the new religion. And we should all worship the state and obey the state. And uh, I think, was it Mussolini? You might correct me, but I think Mussolini said everything should be the state. Everything should come from the state. Everyone should worship and love the state, which, you know, leads us into the sort of idea of Orwell in 1984 and so on. But if you really want to get into this idea that the conservatives are just socialists with a blue blue rosette on, then do get hold of a theory of uh, socialism and capitalism by Hopper, which I think you can download freely from Mises.org anyway. And perhaps the best illustration of this merging um, of previously, well, apparently separate um, viewpoints is in the US really with um, two, you know, on paper, very different presidents, uh, Bush Jr., uh, the, the, the idiot boy, and um, Barack Obama. And you look at the direction the country was going in under Bush, it has been maintained and accelerated generally under Obama. And all the things, and Obama able to run on a campaign ticket, which he then later mostly tore up. And this this previously in the country that was um, a beacon of freedom, you know, 152 oh, I, years ago. I, I think it's been a long process, but um, I think it all goes back, if you get into Thomas de Lorenzo, it all goes back to a guy called Alexander Hamilton, and he sowed the uh, he sowed the seeds of America's misfortune. I actually um, saw his grave in New York. I think it was his grave. There it was uh, near Wall Street, <laughs> sort of his spiritual home. Mm. Um, if, if you want to get into that, then read uh, Thomas de Lorenzo and uh, about Alexander Hamilton. So that he put the seeds in. It's a bit like the uh, the universe. You know, if you if you do the Big Bang and you just rearrange things ever slightly differently, you get a totally different shaped universe. Same thing happened there. Alexander Hamilton was in at the Big Bang, railroaded through the uh, the Constitution, which um, people have, it's just a tissue of paper which can be endlessly manipulated by politicians. And from that thing, which most people in the US at the time didn't know about, didn't vote about, didn't care about, 
Um, we we have the we have the imperial uh, creature uh, bestriding the world that we you know that we that we have now. Well, the the practicalities and all the exciting uh, possibilities we could talk about with regards to how the mechanics of uh, secession and creating little pockets of um, of freedom loving humanity will probably make an entire program in itself. So perhaps we could best just close really by saying that currently at the minute we do seem to be more or less globally but certainly in the West going in one direction and that is in the in the direction of a socialist super state particularly here in the EU we understand this we see it every day uh, the effect it has on our lives and it does rather look like things are going to get worse before the possibility um, of, them, of them getting better certainly have, from our perspective have faith Greg it cannot last because of the economic calculation problem um, it will collapse it, it they, they can they can run an agrarian society I mean what I think they'll try to do is they'll try to have a world paper money from a world bank um, but this will just accelerate their decline. Um, it will collapse. Obviously, we want everyone listening to this to come through the other side of the collapse in, in you know, a good state. Uh, to do that, they must defend themselves by uh, by listening to people like Jeff Berwick at the Dollar Vigilante, uh, listening to uh, Eric King on King World News, listening to Dominic Frisby on, on his podcasts and things. They must learn to defend themselves, and hopefully we will all come through the other side in one piece. But it is going to end. I mean, I'm a very short-term pessimist, like uh, like you sound. You are. I think they are, they will try to institute a world government. They will try to institute world paper money, but it will bring on their demise even faster because people will not put up with the society which is which is North Korea. They just will not put up with it. There will be some terrible problems on the way and dislocations and uh, and, and strife. And I, ex- I fully expect to go through uh, those things myself. I mean, some of us will end up in a in a federal cage. I'm no no doubt about that whatsoever for daring to uh, to, to say the emperor has no clothes. But, you know, we will come through the other side and things will improve uh, in the long run. (laughs) Let's just hope that we are both around. And so is everyone listening to this in the long run? Yeah, I sincerely hope that what you speak of happens in my lifetime as well. And I think that if all of us um, learn about the alternatives and consider what we can do uh, to advance our own freedom and, and that of other people, then uh, the end of what we're currently facing will come sooner. And maybe, as I say, in our lifetimes, that would be nice. Well, let's drink to that. On that note, thank you very much, Andy Duncan, for joining us uh, today on LegalizeFreedom.com. My pleasure, again. Is there anywhere you'd like to point people to uh, on the web, perhaps, to if they want to find out anything more about your work and what you do? Well, I run a little website where I put up things just on a I have to put them up basis, and that's uh, thegodthatfailed.org. So just thegodthatfailed.org. Um, I link to things I like, but you go to lourockwell.com, go to the Dollar Vigilante with Jeff Berwick, uh, listen to Dominic Frisbee's podcasts, listen to King World News. Uh, if you're feeling frisky, you might want to try Max Kaiser. Uh, obviously, there's Professor Hopper's own site, which is the I think the Property and Freedom Society. Uh, just have a search on Google for that and you'll find a web page which uh, Stefan Kinsella runs. Anything by Stefan Kinsella is worth uh, worth reading and worth following. Just follow all those things. Um, just try and read as much as you can. There's hundreds and hundreds of free PDF uh, books on the internet. I'm building up um, a pathway of books people should read if they want to get into these things. First book to read is probably Economics in One Lesson. I'm actually writing my own book uh, on Australian economics with a working title of reality economics but that's uh, on the back burner so that'll be a while um, go from there just find out what you can and definitely read democracy the god that failed excellent once again Andy Duncan thank you very much thank you well that's it for another week you've been listening to legalizefreedom.com my name's Greg Moffat until next time goodbye
Thank you.